Mr. Rosendale, you're recognized to speak on any amendments you care to address. Thank you very much, Chairman Cole, and I appreciate the uh, committee being a little patient with me. I've got several amendments to introduce to you folks here this evening. I submitted three amendments to the Fiscal Year 2024 Legislative Branch Appropriations Act. My first amendment, number 11, would prohibit the use of funds made available by this act from being used to carry out the COVID-19 American History Project of the Library of Congress. Specifically, this bill appropriates $1.5 million for this project. The purpose of the COVID-19 American History Project is to collect, preserve, and make available to the public the oral histories of healthcare workers affected by the pandemic. Any fair project that documents COVID-19 must also focus on the harmful impacts of government-imposed lockdowns. Additionally, Congress never explicitly authorized the project. Instead, the project was created by the 2023 omnibus spending package that nearly all of my Republican colleagues voted against. According to the Congressional Budget Office report from April 23, authorizations of appropriations expired before the beginning of fiscal year 2023. The CBO also found that $510 billion in appropriations for 2023 was associated with 428 expired authorization of appropriations. We all have been talking about the unauthorized appropriations as of late. We're spending billions of dollars on projects that were never even authorized. And for those that are listening out there, that means the policy was never considered before a committee of jurisdiction. And we can't change policy through appropriation only. So why in the world would the fund of an authorized policy be appropriated? And this is a question that we all have been, have been asking for quite some time. My second amendment would reduce the top line number of the Legislative Branch Appropriations Act by $453.4 million to go towards the spending reduction account. My amendment would still provide an increase over the fiscal year of the 2022 levels. My third amendment, number 13, would prohibit funds made available by this act to suspend guided tours of the United States Capitol for more than seven consecutive days without a vote by the House of Representatives. The previous speaker closed the Capitol to the American people for over two years. During my first term, my constituents could not get tours of the Capitol building except under very limited circumstances. My office routinely received calls from constituents who were very upset they could not tour the Capitol. The unnecessary closure disrupted vacations and school trips for people throughout the country. Republicans made it a priority to fully reopen the Capitol for the American people. Section 207 of this legislation prohibits funds from being used to eliminate or restrict guided tours of the Capitol. However, it does provide discretion to the Capitol Police Board to suspend tours temporarily by staff and interns for security-related reasons. The legislation does not define temporarily. I understand that there might be security reasons that would lead to a temporary closure. However, I believe if the Capitol Police Board or architect of the Capitol wants to restrict tours for our constituents, then Congress should authorize the restrictions. This brings more accountability to the process. The Capitol belongs to the American people, and their elected representatives should oversee determining when the Capitol is open. My next amendments are in regards to the energy and water appropriation. In addition to my amendments to the legislative branch appropriations, I submitted three amendments to the Fiscal Year 24 Energy and Water Appropriations Act. My first amendment, number eight, would reduce the total appropriations from the bill by $1.55 billion dollars bringing the total cost of the bill down from nearly $58 billion to $56.4 billion. I submitted this amendment to get the total cost of this year's appropriation bills closer to the fiscal 22 levels. I believe that the federal government had enough funding in fiscal year 2022, and that it's time to rein in out-of-control spending. In order to get spending under control, the federal agencies must begin operating at the same levels or at least receive only modest increases. The American people are sick and tired of the DC cartel running up the tab for the American people while our constituents are struggling to make ends meet. 
To be clear, my amendment still allows for a modest increase from 22 spending for energy and water. I'm not trying to slash funding or cripple necessary infrastructure. I am trying to ensure that taxpayers' dollars are used efficiently and then we get our government off the path of financial ruin. My second amendment, number 16, also reduces spending. Specifically, it cuts funding for the Army Corps of Engineers fiscal 22 levels. This year's appropriation would increase Army Corps funding by $620 million from fiscal 22. My amendment would reduce funding for the Army Corps by that amount. Unfortunately, the Army Corps has a long history of running over budget and over time. The solution to the Army Corps wasting taxpayer money is not to reward them with more money. Instead, we must demand that the Army Corps is more responsible and efficient. In Montana alone, there are multiple instances of the Army Corps projects running well beyond their budgets and then turning to the state and local governments to make up that cost. For example, in Miles City, which is situated at the juncture of Yellowstone River and the Tongue River, applied for a Section 205 project with the Army Corps, which would provide up to $10 million in federal funding to fix a levee. Given the floodplain, the city is susceptible to flooding and desperately needs the levee to be repaired. The city was awarded the contract and agreed to match cost 50-50 for the study and 65-35% for the construction. However, the Army Corps has repeatedly failed to meet project timelines and cost, and now the projected cost of the project is up to $100 million, tenfold what they originally had anticipated. Not only are the people of Miles City paying exorbitant amounts for flood insurance, now they're expected to foot that bill for the increase. The Army Corps claims they have to move the project into another investigation and that they couldn't foresee the project costing nearly 10 times the initial budget. To me, that sounds like the Army Corps of Engineers was happy to spend taxpayer money conducting studies, and now they don't want to hold up their end of the bargain. Meanwhile, in a similar story is unfolding at the Lower Yellowstone Irrigation Project and Fish Bypass Structure, which had repairs necessary before the Corps of Engineers even held their ribbon-cutting ceremony. As projects become more expensive and take longer, the Corps of Engineers seeks to shift these costs off to Montanans. I could go on with examples of the Corps' mismanagement, but I think my point is clear. We cannot increase funding to an agency that have proven themselves to be wasteful. It's time for the Corps of Engineers to learn that they no longer get rewarded for failing to complete projects on time and on budget. My last amendment prohibits the Corps of Engineers from transferring the maintenance cost and control of the Lower Yellowstone Irrigation Project fish bypass. As I mentioned, the Corps of Engineers has shown a complete dereliction of duty by trying to transfer the cost and operation maintenance of the fish bypass channel, which is separate from the Lower Yellowstone Irrigation Project. The Army Corps is shifting operating costs that they agreed to take on to the farmers and ranchers who are already facing increased costs. The Lower Yellowstone Irrigation Project was created as part of the Newlands Reclamation Act, signed into law in 1902. The purpose of the Lower Yellowstone Irrigation Project is to divert water from the Yellowstone River to irrigators in eastern Montana and western North Dakota. Currently, the Lower Yellowstone Irrigation Project is a dependable irrigation water supply for approximately 58,000 acres of land in four irrigation districts across the Yellowstone River Valley. The Army Corps of Engineers proposed the Fish Bypass Channel in Montana to address pallid sturgeon populations in the Lower Missouri River because it was cheaper not because they wanted to do a favor for farmers and ranchers in Montana. It was strictly a mitigation program, but now the repairs are required per the warranty obligations from the original work that failed because of poor planning and design. They want to wash their hands of this project and walk away leaving 350 families and several small communities holding the bag or the debt, as it seems. 
This burden from lack of planning by the Corps of Engineers should only be transferred onto a third party at fault. The fish bypass channel is not physically or operationally connected to the diversion of the water for the Lower Yellowstone Irrigation Project. Moreover, it serves only to meet the Onerous Endangered Species Act requirements. It is not needed for irrigation purposes. The country decided to place the pallet sturgeon on the endangered species list. So the entire nation should bear the financial burden of this decision, not solely the 350 families from Montana. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for your time and committee members. I yield back.